All right. Welcome to the podcast, yeah. my brother. How are you doing? Amazing. You, know, you having a good time uh, doing some Tone Crate with us here? Yeah, dude. Creating tones for the Tone Crate. Yeah, creating tones for the Crate. Hell yeah. So uh, how are you enjoying San Antonio so far? San Antone. Well, I mean, we're a little bit outside of San Antone, so I couldn't San tell you. San Antone Crate. But anytime I'm in this city, I think about Ozzy peeing and Pee Wee Herman looking for the basement. <laughs> is, that, is that a thing? Yeah. Everything's Alamo related here. That's true. Have you ever been? Yeah, I've been there. I peed in the basement. <laughs> you peed on Davy Crockett, <laughs> his coonskin hat. Yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Make, so, make it feel at home. <laughs> um, so tell us uh, a little bit about what you've been working on right now. I know you guys just finished uh, a record with Mark Lewis. It's called V, v or, or five, 5, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Okay, cool. And... Uh, I guess if you can just tell us a little bit about the record, um, you know, your inspiration behind it and, you know, kind of what what you guys were thinking when you were writing it. Uh, well, a lot of it got written very quickly, but, you know, a lot of it was uh, kind of in the brain already. So when you have a lot of ideas kicking around up there, when it's time to like actually sit down and commit it to a recording, it kind of just floods out pretty quickly. Luckily, that was the case, and we, we got a bunch of stuff done like in a fairly short amount of time. And uh, <clears throat> I think on this record, the music is more like musically dense than on previous re records. Just like we're utilizing the fact that we have three stringed instruments a lot more than we ever have in the past. We don't have a lot of parts where two guitars and the bass are all playing the same thing. Mm -hmm. We kind of all have our own line, and we're weaving in and out of each other's parts. Yeah. No no different than, like, an orchestra would with some Beethoven piece or something. Obviously, our stuff is not nearly that complex, but uh, that was, like, the idea. Try to get it to be uh, more of a musical fabric than just, like, hey, here's a riff, and that's the song. Mm -hmm. It's like, here's a riff, and then here's an accompanying riff. And then here's a bass line that's not doing any of the same stuff. Mm. So um, in that regard, I think this record came out way more dense than any other one that we've done so far. Nice. Your bass player is really good. I mean. Yeah. Uh, uh, we we have a rotating door of bass players. There's actually a new bass player on this oh, okay. record. <laughs> well, I, I, would, I, I jam uh, Conformicide. Um, you know, every now and then, and I, 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 I've always taken note about like how funky like that dude's ba whoever recorded the bass on that record. Like, yeah, his, that was, that his was bass lines were sick. Nick yeah. Shingelis did the bass on that record. Uh, he's Shout not on the new him. record. Yeah, Nick's the man. He's a really good bass player. Um, but you know, we just kind of had creative differences and e everything that uh, went down to his exit from the band was kind of falls under that umbrella. And uh, so that happened during the writing process, but um, we got a new dude. He's from Nashville. His name is Brandon Bruce, and um, he's he's a guitar player, drummer, and a bass player, and can sing really well. Nice. So his input was pretty uh, pretty valuable to how the songs turned out in the end. Nice. So he filled the he filled those shoes pretty pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he wasn't like mainly a bass player at the time so when uh you know we we had the conversation about you know who we were gonna get to play bass he kept throwing his himself out there as a guy that could do it and um and you're like no dude you're not a bass player i'm not gonna have you <laughs> <laughs> kind of yeah we were like <laughs> you know this dude doesn't he's not a bass player yeah uh that's not his forte <laughs> excuse me we could edit that out, right? It's fine. Or just amplify it and make it four yeah, times we'll, louder I'll put and distort on it. it. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> put some delay on it. <laughs> yeah. Um But yeah, he he Brandon sent some videos of him playing some of the older stuff and like the dude could hang, he could fucking do it. So um he's a friend of all of ours and you know, we just decided like, yeah, this will be Easy, and he's eager to do it, and we already all know him, and uh, he's toured before, and you he know what he's a very musical, about. creative person, so it, it worked out well. That's awesome. 
Um, we talked a little bit about you guys having worked with uh, Terry Date in the past. Yep. Um, super cool dude. Um, what was that like for you guys? Uh, Terry Date mixed our third record, A Natural Selection. So unfortunately, I didn't get to like hang out with Terry Date and like look over his shoulder while he was doing stuff. But uh, we did meet him in Seattle, where he lives. And uh, at the time that we were getting that mi- that record mixed, he was moving out of his studio and into a new one. So he had to do the mix like in a room that he was not used to mixing in. Um, and the the thing that happened during the mixing of that is stuff got a little behind schedule. Um, and by the time we were finally getting mixes back, we were already on tour. So we were getting mixes and listening to them like in a van on headphones and yeah, like that, trying yeah. to listen in headphones and like on shitty van speakers going 70 miles an hour down the highway and having <laughs> right back like, Hey, we want to tweak this and this. And, uh, you know, hopefully you get this in time to, to change it. Yeah. So it was a really scary process just because of that, um, which, you know, is no fault of Terry's and no fault of ours. It was just a, a timing thing, just bad timing. Yeah. But uh, Terry was super cool. Every time I talked to him on the phone and had, like, any notes uh, for him or wanted to pick his brain about s- stuff or, uh, you know, just – uh, let him know what we're looking for and shit like that. He was super cool, really easy to talk to, super chill. He didn't seem like um, a, an aggressive or like angry person. No, he yeah, super super chill and relaxed and uh, like very go with the flow kind of dude. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll I'll take his number like when we're done with this, so I can pick his brain about stuff. Too. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you his home yeah, address. Just pass, it, pass it to me. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll get, blue, <laughs> blueprint of his house <laughs> show you where he sleeps hell yeah that's <laughs> what i'm talking about um that's awesome so this new record um did you guys i know you guys worked with mark lewis i'm a fan love his work did you guys talk to anybody else about doing this record or is this something that you know mark approached you about or you approached him how did that <clears throat> how did you guys come to working with mark on this yeah so we had a handful of people on our short list of dudes we would possibly want to do the re- record with but um Mark was at the top of it because Mark had come out to our shows multiple times in the past. And every time Mark would see us, he talked to us after the show and be like, Hey man, when are we going to do a record? Uh, and, and that happened a number of times. So when we were looking at our short list, his name kept like jumping out to us. Cause it's like, this dude wants to do it. It wasn't like, Hey, we need to go ask this person if they'd be interested. Like he's already expressed interest and said that like, he's all about it. Yeah, totally. Um, so his enthusiasm for doing it really, uh, made us want to go that Work direction. Yeah. And instead of hiring somebody and they're just like, Oh, okay, here we go. Another day at work. Yeah. Totally. Um, he was actually excited to do it. So that's the re- reason we went with Mark. Um, but the desire to, to work, uh, with each other and collaborate was mutual. Mark's a beast and we all like his mixes and the stuff that he's done. So the fact that he was, uh, you know, wanting to work with us was exciting and very cool that uh, a dude like that was looking at our band in a, in that way, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. He's, he's awesome. I mean, there's not, there's a lot of guys out there that are doing it that are, you know, okay. And then there's the legends and, you know, Mark to me, what did I, what did I, I, t- I saw him at Nam last year and I said, you're, you're reaching goat status, you know, <laughs> you familiar with the goat? Yeah. Greatest of greatest all time. Of yeah. All time. So you're reaching goat status, bro. And he, <laughs> he thought that was pretty funny, but it's true though. I mean, he's, um, the, the level of work that he's doing at the, I mean, the quality of work he's doing at the level he's at, um, which is, you know, like I said, he's reaching that goat status. I mean, it's just really, really good. Is there anyone else, uh, on your list that uh, you have not had a chance to work with that you would love to work with in the future? Yeah, there's tons. Like, I would love to learn from as many people as I can, honestly. Um, we've done stuff with Terry Date. We've done stuff with Steve Evitz and Mark Lewis. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to work someday with and, and learn a couple of tricks from Andy Sneap. Uh, Joe Barisi, um, 
Colin Richardson, Max Norman. Like there, there's a bunch of really killer engineers and producers and uh, mixing dudes out there and dudettes Hell that yeah. that I would love to uh, just you know come in contact with and. Even if all I learn is one trick from them, that kind of shit is invaluable. Yeah, it all yeah. stacks up and adds up and over you're, time. You're talking as an engineer. Yeah, because I mean, I recorded, uh, I engineered the first three Havoc records uh, and did all the tracking on them. And I've worked at venues for a long time and been doing audio for well over a decade. So that shit really interests me. Was uh, you didn't engineer this last one? Mark did, correct? Correct. Yeah. So uh, did you take away anything from that experience working with him that you that you were kind of like, oh, that's cool? Yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of little tricks and doodads that I learned along the way. Um, you know, I learned uh, about, like, room mics, room mic placement, the kinds of mics, uh, guitar miking, compression t- tips, uh, things to listen for songwriting stuff um yeah all kinds of shit just some weird like production tricks that are just like ear candy things yeah 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 there's a bunch of little tiny tidbits they, they, they don't come every day and no one goes like hey there's a good trick about to pop up in the next two minutes you just yeah. have to like pay attention, pay attention and be yeah. present exactly. and uh yeah every once in a while you'll catch a little snippet of something great that will enhance your work in the future oh yeah that's awesome, man. Well, congrats on finishing that record. Uh, when's it coming out? comes out on May Day. May 1, 2020. May 1st, 2020. Cool. Pre, pre-save that, that shit on Spotify and all those things. Oh, hell yes. <laughs> hell yes. Yes. Well, cool. Um, so apart from the band, what do, you, uh, what do you like to do? I know you said you, you do front of house stuff at venues kind of in your hometown. Yeah. Uh, you live in Denver. Um, when you're not when you're not doing like music stuff, like what do you what are you into? I like to watch documentaries. I like to uh, hike. I like road trips. Love stand up comedy. Um, occasionally, if I have time, I like to read. <laughs> yeah, what kind of stuff do you like to read? Uh, I like nonfiction for the most part. I like philosophy and history and science and stuff like that you ever dive into like any of that like um self-help personal development type stuff Mm, no but i probably should (laughs) (laughs) that's funny yeah i mean that's that's the kind of stuff that i'm into you know like stuff like you know leadership and yeah you know like psychology and how your brain works and i guess like what are they like behavioral psychology like why people why people do the things that they do and I know it's kind of it's cool to me because like it actually helps like in the job too you know like working in the studio and you have so many different types of personalities and you know you like take away little nuggets from those books about you know how to communicate with people more effectively and for sure you know those little tiny nuggets of knowledge will help in the long run throughout your whole life so yeah something I talked to the uh, the wife about uh, a couple weeks ago is uh, is hiking and I I had the question what. What constitutes a hike? Like, what makes a hike a hike versus just going for a walk in nature? Well, it's basically the same thing. <laughs> Go for a walk in the woods and, you know, when when you're in a place where you can barely hear cars and, uh, you know, it's quiet and you hear birds and rustling around from squirrels and giant insects and... <laughs> Hopefully that's, not the giant insects. but That's what makes the hike. Bears maybe, wolves, no. Yeah, I mean, that stuff could be out there. Bears and uh, mountain lions and stuff like that in Colorado. But uh, I, I, for me, like, sometimes I will go on a hike that is just literally a super chill, easy walk in the woods. Yeah. Other times it's a brutal workout that takes, you know, four hours. Uh, depends on what you want to do for the day, but I think either way, it's really good for your brain and good for uh, your outlook, and it's like a good reset button, you know? Totally. Getting outside of a city and not hearing cars or ambulances or worrying about anything. You're just kind of enjoying the moment. Yeah. There's a lot to look at, a lot to smell. The The smell of the forest is 
something you don't get when you're walking around on a sidewalk or sitting around at home. Right. There's all that extra oxygen in the air and it seems clean and I think it's uh good for like detoxifying your mind. Is that kind of like is that your favorite um like release like some people meditate or things like that is kind of that kind of like your go-to thing to yeah like it's like active meditation yeah like you're you're doing something but it is very therapeutic and i i, th- I would imagine at at the end of it the result on on your stress levels and your clarity is probably very similar between meditating going on a hike going for a long run going fishing yeah just being out breathing that all that oxygen sure you know? yeah I'm sure that's a thing. Yeah, I wonder, like, I wonder if that's one of the reasons why, like, there's such, like, prevalent amounts of depression and, like, anxiety out there, like, in societies. Like, people just, you know, stuck on their phones. I think like, that's part of it. And not not really not really getting out, you know, not really enjoying. I know, like, for us, like, our studio um, here in San Antonio is kind of, like, in the, what they call, like, the Texas Hill Country and I, I want to say it's like one and a half or two acres of just raw land that's out here. And so sometimes, you know, when we're on a break or if there's no client here, I'm taking a break mixing, I'll just go stand outside and, you know, stand in the sun and just kind of breathe. And there's there's a certain kind of like, um, I don't know, there's a certain sensation that happens when you have like sunlight, like hitting your skin and you're like breathing in like natural air that kind of releases like some type of endorphin you know definitely at least yeah. that, that's how it is for me and there's been times i've been like you know stressed out and i'll go out there like leave the phone in here and just kind of go breathe stand in the sun kind of look at the sky and it's like you know i, w- I mean it helps it really does it's there's like something about it taking a chill pill without putting anything in your body yeah yeah the uh the, it's a legal uh chill pill yeah know? and it's free yeah you don't gotta pay for it or go to, <laughs> go to a dumpster behind a denny's or something you know and you can i mean i'm not one to judge <laughs> so, different people have a different happy place yeah 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 some people smoke their happy place right <laughs> yeah some people boof their happy place <laughs> Some people do their happy place off a venue toilet or something. <laughs> that's getting, you know, I'm getting out of hand here. Um, well, that's cool, man. Yeah, I, I, I don't have the opportunity to, uh, to hike very often. And I, I, you know, to be honest, I like had like an aversion to like the outdoors. You know, I never really did a lot of that stuff. Like as a kid, you know, I was always just kind of cooped up in my house. And so the thought of like being out, like going camping or something, like being out in nature, like overnight was like, Nah, I got to have my air conditioner and like all that stuff. But I don't know there's something like as of late that's kind of opened my eyes to that stuff and like wanting to kind of have a, a deeper appreciation for, you know, nature itself. And that and I kind of have this like weird thing about like wanting to see aliens, you know? Yeah. And you, uh, you live close to Mexico. What kind of aliens are we talking about? <laughs> no, <I'm... laughs> that's fucked up. Uh <laughs> No, like the, uh, like the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, UFO types, you know, like, well, yeah, I, I've, I'm not like Tom DeLong or anything like that. But I've I, seen some weird things, uh, while I've been out. What's the um, weirdest thing you've seen like that? Tell me the story. Uh, this one time I was, uh, out in, uh, Europe and I was hanging out late night in a park and laying on my back in the grass, staring at the sky. Was a female involved? <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was hanging out with a friend of mine and uh we were both there laying in the grass staring at the sky and we laid there long enough to kind of uh get a real grasp on how what a plane looks like when it's going over, what a satellite looks like when it's going over and like the speed at which they're traveling. We'd seen dozens of them by now, like satellites and planes go by. So mm-hmm. super familiar with the speed, the sound, if there was any, you know, from an airplane. And uh, we're hanging out, and I see something moving in the sky. So the plane of the two, between a plane and a satellite, the plane is slower. Satellite's much faster. Um, and I see this thing that's moving, and it's moving like three times faster than any other satellite that we've seen all night. And it appeared to be three points of light, all kind of in a very like obtuse triangle shape. 
pointing like flying in, in a flying V kind of formation. Three points of light, and it seemed to block out um, the light behind it. It seemed to have some sort of a structure, mm-hmm. like a kind of looked like a boomerang. But imagine there was a a light on the two wings and in the center. Right. This thing was flying like three times faster than any satellite that went by. And, uh, you know, I thought I was just fucking crazy. I was like, do you see that? And the girl was like, no, what? And I'm like pointing at it and like tracing it in the sky. And eventually she's like, oh my God. Yeah. What the fuck is that? Like, I don't know, but I'm glad you <laughs> see it too. Cause otherwise I, I would think I'm insane. Yeah. Um, I've never seen anything like that again. And the craziest part is it seemed to be flying lower than planes. It was moving faster than satellites and there was no sound. Mm. Every plane that went overhead, even if it was like cruising altitude, you could hear it. You know, there's a delay because audio's, you know, sound travels slow. Yeah. Um, But, you know, you could hear a plane even at cruising altitude because we're kind of like in the middle of nowhere. And uh, this thing had zero sound and was f- fucking j- cruising so fast. Uh, three weird points of light, all blacked out, no sound. It was one of the, it was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in my life. I still don't have an explanation for what it was. Yeah, but maybe it was aliens. Like man. that guy. Yeah, like that dude. Yeah, that's dude, that's awesome, man. Like I, I, I got to do one tour. Um, when I was like in my, my jamming days, uh, I think I was like 18, 19 years old, like 2004, 2005 time frame, And, um, you know, we're in a van, you're just driving through like just desert at you know, somewhere around the West coast. It's just pure, like empty flatland, not a single light out. You can see as like, it's so dark out that you can actually like, I can, I feel like I could see like the streak of like the Milky way, the Milky way. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, line. you definitely like, can. And, um, and yeah, at that point it was, there was like these, like it was either five or six lights and then they would like, whoosh, like they were taking like these different formations and then, and then it'd branch out and then like come back together and then like change structure and everyone else is asleep. And I'm like trying to like get somebody and they're like, ah, fuck off. You know, I'm like, oh dude, like you gotta see it. I'm the only one that saw it. It's so, like, <laughs> I'm kind of like you. Like, I feel like I'm like, I feel like I might've dreamt it, but there's no way, you know what I mean? Like, you know, were you driving? No, no, I was just on the ground of the van because there was too many dudes. Right, and um, I was just that's like a looking. good band name, by the way. <laughs> too many dudes. Too many dudes. <laughs> like the the two fat guys, uh, mechanics. Yeah, yeah. That that's what Slipknot used to be called, right? <laughs> too many dudes. Too many dudes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, it's nuts, and uh, I'm I'm just like super fascinated by that. You talk. I mean, you mentioned documentaries, like. I mean, on my downtime, like if I'm not watching like San Antonio Spurs basketball games, like I go to Netflix and I'm like looking for whatever new uncovered alien expose type documentary that they have. Do yeah. You, uh, do you ever watch uh, Joe Rogan? Yeah, of course. Uh, did you see that uh, that show that he did with um, with the dude that like supposedly was trying to reverse engineer those spacecrafts. Yeah. The Bob Lazar, Bob Lazar. Yeah. 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 I saw yeah. the movie and I saw that episode. What do you think of that? Uh, it's really interesting. I mean, the dude's story seems to check out and it seems like, you know, from watching Rogan and watching that documentary, it seems like the people he was employed by tried to like get Cover rid of him. any record that he was there. Yeah. But then that in, in that documentary, there's that one part where the the employee phone book shows his name in it. Yeah. Like why would that ha- exist if he wasn't there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating. There's, there's paper clippings. Yeah, there's there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of like v- really convincing evidence of um alien spacecrafts and shit like that. But that is pretty. Pretty intriguing. Um, obviously, like, there's no photographs or anything like that, so yeah, it's really hard to say, but the dude's story seems to check out, and I'm a very skeptical person about a lot of things. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that documentary was pretty mind-bending. I don't know. 
It, it could be real, could not be real. I don't know. Yeah. I, uh, Rogan says it best. Like, I want it to be real. You yeah. Know? Like, I, I really do. The, um, that dude, he's a little, a little nutty. The one that, like, did the documentary, that younger guy. Mm hmm. He was on Rogan again, um, a few months after, and he brought, uh, captain, an air of a retired air force, like captain or general. Yeah. Um, on who was like one of the only people to like capture video of, um, UFO or they, they call him something else now, UAP unexplained aerial phenomenon, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he, um, he caught this this thing on camera and it's it's like um declassified you can find it online yeah and um like he was describing his experience and kind of like what he saw and like how it how it moved around and like it was hovering over some water did you did you catch that i think i've seen clips from that episode yeah yeah on the joe rogan clips <laughs> yeah there's yeah. a billion of go those. down those youtube rabbit holes yep yeah um yeah it's just super super fascinating i can't get enough i mean i binged i think the whole like ancient aliens thing for like, I don't know, like in a week, two weeks on Netflix. Yeah. Um, I don't see any definitive evidence that we've been visited by aliens, but it's not unthinkable. Um, but if there was any thing that's so unexplainable that you would almost think it had to be aliens is the pyramids. Oh yeah. I mean, people still, experts still don't know how the fuck those things got built yeah and then they're <laughs> they're they're like real strategic like geographical <clears throat> placement on like the strong like magnetic um poles of yeah they line up with the orion's the belt they're mm -hmm. perfect north south east west yeah the stones are enormous you can't fit a razor blade in between the cracks some of them were cut from a quarry like hundreds of miles away yeah yeah, yeah. i don't know um they they don't know how they made those. If there was any evidence that could point towards maybe aliens were here, that might be uh, incriminating. <laughs> the the thing that the thing that gets me about and on the, along the lines of that is like if you take a look at like the timeline of like of of history and technology, and you look at, I mean, a hundred years ago. You know, you're talking about 1920. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, automobiles are, you know, new, <laughs> brand new. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what year um, off the top of my head was, like, the first powered manned flight. But you're talking about, like, the Wright Brothers. It was, like, the early 1900s um, situation. And it's this, it's this rickety thing that, you know. And then... You know, 1930s, 1940s rolls around. I don't remember the exact year, 1946, 1950, in that range. You have, or it might have been, it's somewhere in there. I'm, I know I'm, I sound like a buffoon right now trying to, like, give information or scientific facts when I don't, can't even get my date straight. But <laughs> but you have, you have like, horse-drawn carriages, and you have, you get to automobiles, you know, at some point. You have this, this real rickety powered mind, my, uh, man flight situation that happens. Then Roswell happens, you know, like New Mexico. And from the point of like Roswell happening, that event, we have like stealth bombers, you know, within within a couple of years. You know, we have these insane like battle, like military weapon, weaponized crafts that like actually even resemble you know what our what our brains tell us like you know ufos look like these sl these sleek undetectable by radar like metallic ships and stuff you have like this this point of like the the 1800s if you will you know or the late 1800s early 1900s we go from like horse drawn carriages to like automobiles and just like paraphrasing this timeline and then you know around the around the era of like roswell like that event happening yeah. you know and it was like written about there was a crash of a craft no one recognized. Then it was the weather balloon. There was never that story never got straight. And then from that moment on, you have it was like the um, the introduction of like the CIA happened like within a year of that or pretty much coincide. And I don't know if it's the CIA or it wasn't the FBI. It was it was the CIA or something like that. And then um, and then all of a sudden our technology just booms, explodes, right? it yeah. explodes. I mean, we go from rickety 
you know, Wright Brothers aircraft and, you know, these were fresh out of horse drawn carriages to like having like stealth bombers and like this incredible, like these incredible military crafts that are like undetectable by radar. And it's just, it's to me, it's, it's nonsensical. And, and every year, every year from that point on, I mean, the technology is doubling, you know, and our, our, yeah. our, our weaponry is, and it's going to keep happening. It's going to keep happening. And, and it's just, it's crazy because <clears throat> like, if you look at the timeline, like the historical timeline, I mean, across humanity in general, and now we're doing things that, I mean, it's insane, like the technology that we have right now. And it's, I mean, from the, from the, the, not the skeptical viewpoint, but just from someone who like wants to believe in that, in that shit, like it seemed to kind of be based around loosely that event, you know? Yeah. It, it could be some of that. It, uh, also, you know, when Nikola Tesla died, uh, the U S government like seized all of his paperwork and all of his stuff. <sighs> Tesla, man, that dude might've been the smartest human that lived in the last He's 5,000 years. Yeah. He slept on, I think, People don't talk about him. People don't know about him. They don't teach us about him in school. Th- and there's a reason for that, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's that's that's for putting the what do they call it, like the tin foil hats on right now. Yeah, yeah, like that that dude had, from what I understood, created a way for people to have like f- free, wireless free energy, wireless, natural, safe, unlimited electricity. Yeah, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. My under, I'm not a fucking physicist, so this is just my understanding. You're not? No. Oh, okay. I'm a physician. <laughs> Physicist. Yeah. You're you're a part of the FBI, the female body inspectors. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, the head of it. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I've read Tesla's autobiography and I've watched documentaries really? about him, and uh, my understanding is that, so like the air we're breathing right now is electric. Uh, we we know that it it can conduct electricity. There's we see lightning bolts. Mm-hmm. We get radio. We get fucking satellite. We get cell service. The air has a lot of uh, you know uh, electricity moving around in it. Um, and from my understanding, Tesla figured out how to tap into that electricity that's in the air naturally and amplify it and utilize it to uh, light up light bulbs. Or to run a machine or whatever. Um, if if that is the case, and his ideas were built upon instead of like suppressed, we'd be living in like a completely different world right now. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, that's not the way <laughs> it goes Dude. in the old uh, society here. Did you ever hear about the guy that was able to make his car he converted his car to run on water? Yeah, and then he got then he, poisoned yeah. at a fucking he talk. Got, he got he got got, you yeah. know. And yeah. they like confiscated his his uh his technology and like Yeah, what was that dude's name? Um he he was I know exactly re- he was talking really about. vocal about it. I think his name was Stan Myers. And uh yeah, that that dude converted a car to to run on water sea water ice water or ice snow tap water yeah whatever you could just throw it in there and it would run um i know a lot of like people that are scientifically trained would say that it doesn't work but if that's the case why were people offering this dude a billion dollars cash to buy his uh patent from him and he was all over news, all over national news, yeah, uh, showing off this thing. Like, how would that happen if if it didn't work and if it was a a sham? I don't know how it would ever get to that point. Yeah, there's even there's even some weird there's a weird situation like that that happened with General Motors because they were they were actually the first to drop an electric car. Oh yeah, electric cars have been around since like the fucking fifties. Yeah, like, and <laughs> they, uh, they, they dropped this electric car, and they were all leases, and they, um, they, once the leases were up, they took them and they, 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 they destroyed all of them. You yeah, know, it was like it's like a, it was a weird shady thing. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah, it's pretty fascinating when you you learn stuff like that. You know, we we could be living in a way different world um, right now if, if some of the good ideas that have come up over time 
were embraced and built on instead of squashed and suppressed and like covered up. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> it's, it's pretty insane that like, you know, in all of my 12 years of proper schooling, I never heard Nikola Tesla's name ever. Mm -mm. I never heard about him in elementary or middle school or high school. Yeah, you you hear about the ones that were groundbreaking that weren't a threat to the machine. Yeah, you know, you, like you Einstein. hear about Edison all the time. Yeah. Edison was heralded all the time in school. Yeah, but like Tesla was, Tesla worked with him and then eventually worked against him and was funded by J.P. Morgan, the same exact person. Yeah. Um, and and you you don't hear about Tesla and you know Tesla, arguably, and uh. You know, a lot of people would agree that Tesla's ideas were better than Edison's. Supposedly, and I don't have any, I didn't read up on it deeply, but supposedly Edison wasn't really all that. Like, he wasn't actually the one sitting there trying to build a light bulb. So he, he was probably like Steve Jobs. He was like, like Steve hey, Jobs. I need a fucking light bulb. One of you nerds get this thing and exactly. then I'll get the credit because I pay you. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. He had a team yeah. of people. I mean, that could be the case. And it was like, it was his idea, I think, to make a light bulb, just like it was Steve Jobs' idea to make, to make a, a touchscreen yeah. device. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and and he just was like, got, got to the brightest people he could and it was his project. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's not a knock against him. I mean, he, he had a great idea, clearly, but, and he put the right team together. No one else, no one else did, you know? Um, you know, it's just like anything, right? You know, the bands are a team, you know, making records is a team, you know, it's not... Typically, not typically just one dude doing everything, although that that does happen a lot these days. But yeah, it's it is it is interesting to hear about some of these guys, like uh, even like Henry Ford. You know, like how he ended up like kind of going insane. You know, I don't know if you heard about that. Like, there's some old books, some old like personal development books. One of my favorite books of all time is called uh, "Think and Grow Rich." Mm -hmm. It's written by a man named Napoleon Hill, and um, in that book, he interviews. A lot of guys from from that era is in the 1930s. He has interviewed um, um, some of the famous uh, bankers, you know, of the time. Like, and um, uh, Henry Ford was one of those people that he uh, interviewed. But later on, um, in different books, like you kind of hear stories um, about how like Henry Ford actually had like difficulty passing his company down to like his son and like kind of started sabotaging people and like wanted to always be the man. And like, it was, it was like, really interesting, you know, how like history suppresses unfavorable details about like stuff. That's just, I don't know, I guess that maybe affects the bottom line. In history some way, is written form. by the victors as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on our on our new record, there's a a song on it called "Cosmetic Surgery," and the song is basically about cover ups, about like you know we've never heard of Nikola Tesla. Most people in this country, um, the same thing with like you know the dude that made his car run on water. Yeah, there, there's a lot of things where you know you learn a little bit more that's outside of the box of like what common knowledge is. You find out a little bit more of the details of something that happened, and you're scratching your head like, why the fuck have I been believing this bullshit for so long? You know, like, yeah. why, why did no one tell me about this? Right. And uh, so there, there is a song on the new record that, that's talking about this kind of stuff. That's cool. Yeah. Um, did yeah, you I, mention I think it's, Tesla by name? Uh, no, didn't mention Tesla by name, but... Uh, He's implied if you nice. listen to the lyrics. Um, that dude was, he invented the radio. And I was taught, even in my history books in school, in high school, I remember it. It said that it was uh, Marconi, the Italian dude, that invented the radio. After Tesla died, they gave the patent rightfully to Tesla. Tesla had invented the radio. Marconi somehow got the credit for it. And like Tesla died without even having the proper credit for one of the most important inventions, maybe of all time. Right. Radio. And uh, yeah, that dude just fucking died penniless and like, uh, you know, mocked and and uh, looked at as a fucking kook. He was out of his fucking mind, but he was a brilliant <laughs> kook. Yeah. And, and from what what I can gather, a very nice person. Yeah. He, he wanted the best for humanity. He wanted society to 
to grow and prosper and and uh, thrive. Right. You know, and uh, I think it's really interesting that even my history books, which uh, you know, in a public school, those were sanctioned by the U.S. government for me to know. They they were telling me the facts that they wanted me to absorb and have in my head. Yeah, as the truth. And the thing that's one instance that I'll never forget that was in my government sanctioned book that was an absolute lie. Yeah. And and then here we have one of the most important in- inventors and minds of the last several thousand years and no one's ever fucking heard about him. They're not talking about him in a history class yeah. or science class. Like he should be talked about in physics and in history. Right. Just uh, like Einstein. Yeah, no different than Einstein. Yeah. He might have been fucking even more brilliant than Einstein. Yeah. I mean, this dude figured out <laughs> if if what I understand is true, this dude figured out wireless, natural, safe, unlimited electricity using the earth as its own power source. <laughs> and radio <laughs> and the ideas behind x-rays and television uh, and alternating current, which, you know, ACDC, you see that shit on every outlet for mm-hmm. power. That That's thanks to Tesla. Right. Like we use his his uh, one of his inventions every day, but no one fucking knows about the guy. Everyone knows the cars, but they're named after the genius person. But everyone hears Tesla and they think of either an electric car or a rock band from the eighties. Right. Um, I think Elon Musk. That was probably like his his subtle nod. Yeah, to definitely. Like, like, yeah. Like. This, like there's genius like between your you know if you're willing to look for it you know what i mean like i'm giving you i'm giving you like what should have always been you know I mean? sure <laughs> like an electric car that even okay the the argument i've heard from uh people that are like way into physics way knowledgeable and engineers and stuff is that with tesla's idea is like it could work to transmit electricity through the air wirelessly but it wouldn't be very much power is the argument i've heard now, even if that's the case, what if it was only enough power for fucking light bulbs to be on? That would be a gigantic savings in resources that are having to be used to, to light up a city. Right. Or light up a small village or whatever. Um, you know, it's it's a fucking shame that a, a, a dude's ideas, a dude that was that brilliant, his ideas are just kind of fucking... We're thrown in the sea and like never to be seen again. You know what's interesting um, about that stuff as well. While we're on the subject of like suppression and like conspiracy theories and things like that, um, not that I consider that a conspiracy theory. That's that's very real. That Tesla is just not talked about in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so like another one of those like situations that's a little weird is like, I have a friend that um, got started um, in the solar panel business and anyways he was like at my house and he was kind of like walking me through it he was like kind of like semi pitching me the to get solar panels but also just kind of like practicing running through his his presentation yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. when he got started and uh towards the end of the presentation he he reached a point where he was like explaining how it works with cps and he basically uh, cps is um city public service that's like our electric electricity provider for san antonio okay um and so basically he says yeah we we hook up a an an inverter which allows the solar uh energy to be converted to electricity to power your house and it ties in um this the this this electric company it comes out and they hook they hook that up and it, it can't get started until they hook that up so i asked him i said so there isn't a way to like just hook up solar panels and run my power my house off that energy without cps being involved and he kind of like i guess saw what i was alluding to and he's like no you can't like basically the way it works is you generate you generate electricity you're technically selling that electricity to the electric company Mm -hmm. the electricity the electric company is is then get crediting your bill right? right so like if you don't produce enough their energy you're buying you know you you're paying for the difference right sure which is kind of a, a benefit but you could theoretically 
uh, put an, uh, an extra couple of panels on your roof and produce more an excessive energy so that you're never in a deficit. And then they pay you, and right? Then, and then you build a credit, yeah, with the CPS com- with the electric company, which is but, kind of cool. Which but, is which is cool, but why? But the question that's posed is like. If you don't want to have why, anything, why to do can't with them? I just fucking be off the grid? Right, you know what I mean. Like in, in Florida, it's illegal. That whole state, you, you can't be off the grid. No, it, I think it's illegal everywhere. You know, I mean, you. you no, can, it's not illegal in all states. Definitely. No, not. it isn't. No. Okay. Well, for here, sure not. here it is. I mean, I don't know that it's illegal, but from what I understand, it's not gonna. It can't happen. Right. Like they're not gonna. That that exchange thing isn't gonna happen. Have you, you know ever I mean? heard of Earth ships? No. Earth ships are these houses that are made out of mostly recycled materials. Um, uh, the the main walls of the house are made out of like old shitty tires that are useless, mm-hmm. and you pack them full of dirt. So they're super heavy, and you fucking basically build the, the main spine or the main like structure of the house out of these things. Um, you build all the interior walls and stuff with like bottles and cans and some sort of like uh, putty of some kind, con- concrete. Yeah. And uh, these things, the the whole idea is garbage is indigenous to the whole world. There's fucking trash everywhere. Um, and this dude named Michael Reynolds is like a, a, a legit architect that went to school for it. And uh, he's an engineer and he's like, you know, why the fuck are we still making houses the same way they made them in 1820? Like, this is really stupid. We need to, like, update what we're doing here. So if you're in the northern hemisphere... You build it in a way where there is a giant glass side of the house that's in the northern hemisphere you'd want facing south, so it's always getting sunlight, right? And in these houses, you deck them out with, like, solar or wind or whatever uh, for your electricity, but you have an indoor garden that, that's basically a greenhouse. The front of your house is a greenhouse, essentially. Um, and from that solar energy... You get to grow your own food indoors year round, regardless of the climate, um, and using just convection, just wind flow, and you know the the mass of the tires and uh, the sunlight. The, those things can stay in between like sixty seven, I think, and seventy two degrees mm. year round, regardless of the climate. Nice. Grow your own food. Have your own water supply. Uh, yeah, and the water comes from, like, uh, the dew in the morning and snow and rainfall and shit like that. You can live in the desert. Uh, it, it would be enough. Uh, the way that it uses the water is, like, super uh, – it recycles it a, a lot. You know, you have super clean water that that's filtered, obviously, um, to wash your hands and brush your teeth and take a shower. But after that, that water gets filtered, and some of it goes and, like – waters your indoor plants Mm -hmm. and some of it goes into your toilet you don't need perfectly clean water to shit into um (laughs) so it gets filtered once you get some goes to your toilet some goes to your garden that's indoors and then after you flush it um that water gets filtered one more time and it goes to like your outdoor lawn or garden or whatever and then the the rest of your literal shit goes to a septic tank these things are uh what are they called? Earth? Earth ships. Earth ships. Everybody should look them up. It's uh, Have you there... seen one in person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can stay in them. There's a whole community. The The first ones were in Taos, New Mexico. And uh, you, you can stay in them like a hotel. There's a whole big like community of them out there. But it's completely off the grid. You have your own power supply. You have your own water supply. Um, you have your own food supply year-round, regardless of Whoa. climate. And... Uh, yeah. Man, like I don't understand why it hasn't caught on more. I mean, I, I kind of do understand why yeah. it hasn't caught on more. Yeah, but things that things that interfere with the machine. Of course, you know what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's the last thing they want is for you to not be sucking on the tit. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. But uh, there's a really great documentary called Garbage Warrior that's about this guy Michael Reynolds, the designer, designer of the thing, yeah. the inventor, and. Uh, I think it's on YouTube. There's like a free version. It's kind of stretched out. Yeah. And uh, it might have like Russian or French subtitles or something. But you can watch it on YouTube. And I know you can definitely buy it on like DVD or whatever. But uh, yeah, everyone that's listening to this, if you don't know about Earth Ships, definitely go and check it out. Oh, yeah. Because I I think that could be a way to, you know, get off of the 
the system's tit and be <laughs> be your own boss. Yeah. And be uh, self reliant. You know, um, th- I, I I know th- that's how I know that it's possible to be off of the grid because like in New Mexico they have that whole community uh, of of those houses and I know they've built them like all over the world and in deserts and in like fucking frozen wastelands you can kind of build them anywhere Uh, I wouldn't doubt that there are some in Texas I know we have some in Colorado there's some they're they're all over the place yeah but definitely check that out because that that might be a way to go free food free water Right. And from what I understand with the earth ships, all you have for monthly bill is like uh, fil- filters, water filtration. It's like the only expense after the building itself is all paid off. Um, and f- I think if I remember right, your monthly you know, bills for the filters, it's like 10 bucks a month for a family. Wow. So once your house is paid off, 10 bucks a month is all you need to like yeah. survive. Yeah, that sounds all right. That's, yeah, that sounds fine. I'll, <laughs> I'll sign up for that deal. <laughs> Man, well, I um, I know we're 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 about having to wrap up here. Um, try to keep these things like around an hour. Um, it's been amazing chatting with you, man, about all this cool shit. Yeah, my um, pleasure. I um, I uh, did this on the last podcast, and I'll, I'll ask you the same question. And um, you know, I work with a lot of bands. Um, you know, here in the studio, I'll come in and out. I know you you've, yeah. been, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, you know, if there's a band out there, a young musician, guitar player, you know, some maybe Tone Crate subscriber or something like that, that wants to, uh, you know, try and make it, you know, in the industry, touring, you know, doing doing the thing like the way you do, like what advice would you give those guys to to try and uh, have some success? Uh, for someone that it wants to be in a band that wants to like be in a touring band, yeah. Like biggest that wants thing. to like make a living doing it. Okay, the biggest thing is find people that have the similar vision. Find people that are as dedicated. If you're super dedicated, you need to find other people that are going to be that fucking down to do it because otherwise you're going to see people come and go because a lot of people say <clears throat> they want a tour and then they go on tour and find out like, oh, shit, we're sleeping on floors and eating like shit and sleeping like shit and driving ourselves and this is a lot of work and you know, yeah. <clears throat> a lot of people say they want a tour and then they go do it and then they fucking bail because yeah. it's it's rough. It's not for everyone. It's like but, having having like four girlfriends. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's like having it's four rough. girlfriends yeah. that you also fucking work with. Yeah, and live with. Yeah, it's rough. And you live in a van. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you make very little money sometimes. Yeah, and you know, it's not. Uh, you know, these are girlfriends that probably don't want you to touch them like at all. <laughs> Like you probably don't want to be getting yeah, it yeah. on with your band members. No, definitely. I, not. I can't speak for everybody, you yeah, know. Yeah. But but you need to find people that are like as down as you are for it, because if not, you're just gonna hit a fucking brick wall. You have to be rowing in the same boat together, the same direction. Otherwise, you're just gonna spin around in circles, or or sink the boat. You know. Yeah. You got to be going the same direction. So. Finding those people is very, very difficult. But when you do find them, fucking bro down and uh, try to march, you know, to the same beat and uh, head the same direction. Um, As far as, like, other advice I would have for people that are touring, like, don't go too big too fast. I've seen some bands that started touring and, you know, they... You like hire a giant crew and fucking rent a crazy vehicle and are shelling out cash to like for all kinds of shit to to like just get out on the road and man it fucking can t- tank your whole band it, it can like fucking just shelf the whole project because everyone goes broke like yeah and you know w- within one year like you guys went from you had a chance to start touring to now like everyone had to sell their house, Mm. you know, that kind of shit does happen. So don't go, (laughs) don't try to fucking, you know, go for spinning slam dunks. Like right after you learn how to shoot a fucking (laughs) free throw. (laughs) Yeah. No, there was, who was the, who was it that I heard about? It was really surprising. I don't know if it was a band like Unearth or, uh, or someone that like, I mean, they were making money, but they had no manager. Yeah. They were handling things pretty much themselves. 
and they drove themselves and they never went up they never scaled up from a from a van and um they were able to all put more money in, like in their pocket and like live comfortably and like save and like yeah like being in a band because they weren't trying to uh not trying to go too big too yeah, soon exactly yeah. yeah and not even and not even try to go too big even when they could just out of out of uh, frugality you know what i mean trying to save money um one of the things I always tell the thing I, I see the most, which is, which is always like, I get it. Cause I've been in the situation, um, was, uh, was bands like having their homie in the band that maybe isn't the best person for the job, mm-hmm. you know, like the bass player, like doesn't have great gear, doesn't have great hands, can't really play the <laughs> bass right. that well, but he's their friend, you know? And it's like, you know, we're having to recut stuff after he leaves and, you know, have someone else play his parts or whatever it might be. And it's just, you know, it's not contributing anything, but it's their friend, you know, so he's got, you know, oh, man, we don't have the heart to get rid of him, you know, like, <laughs> but I tell him, it's like, it's a business, man. Like if, that, that could sink your ship that, too. Yeah. That could, that could definitely sink you. I mean, it affects your live sound, you know, yeah. it affects the way people are hearing. Yeah. It. You got to be competent, you know, find people that are also competent because it's such a cliche, but it's real. Like you're only as strong as your weakest link. Right. And if you've got like your whole you know, band is cool, really huh? killer, but you yeah. know, there's one dude or something that just can't fucking hang. Like it's going to impact the, the perception that the audience has on the entire band. Even if it is just one person, right. The one person being like out of step with everyone else could really, uh, you know, change someone's opinion of the whole project. Mm-hmm. you don't want to have that happen like if you're serious and you want to tour and put out records and do that this that and the other thing like you yeah you got to practice enough until like you know you're fucking somewhat legit you can't go out there and just like fuck it up every yeah. night and expect to go somewhere <laughs> oh yeah sure oh, man i could tell you some stories unless you're millie vanilli <laughs> and it's not real yeah, yeah D- dj macbook <laughs> Yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, hey, I appreciate you doing this podcast with us. Man. Yeah. We've had a good time the last couple of days making these tones. I know the pack's going to be absolutely the killer. Yes. Um, Stoked tones, to get it out. Tones you're going to be using live and uh, tones that can be used in the studio. And Can't so, wait. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for doing the show. Yeah, dude. I'm number right. two, right? You're number two. This is number two? Yes, sir. I'm not number one, but I am the poop. Number two. Number like, two. Like Dr. Evil? Yes. <laughs> All right, man. Y'all take care. Peace.